I am so thrilled our speaker is here today. Um, you know, in athletic competition, to work at the very highest levels is an elite group, but I think there's probably no more pure and intense competition than the sprints of the Olympic Games. In the sprints of the Olympic Games, it's not three tries and you're out. It's not two out of three sets. It's not quarterfinals, semifinals, and if you're not feeling good, we'll put in a sub and our team will still win. In the Olympic Games and the sprints, you have a matter of seconds for all that you have worked for for years to either prove itself out or to not, and you lose. And our speaker today, Earl Young, won the Olympic gold medal in 1960 in Rome. When that moment was in the pressure of that event, he was able to perform at the very highest level and be the top athlete in the world in his event. It's such a treat to have him here, not just because he won that gold medal, but because of what he's done with his life as he's used that gold medal to open doors to serve others. You're going to be inspired by what he has to say today. Would you welcome Olympic champion Earl Young. Thank you, sir. Good morning, Blazers. Hey, number one, I just want to tell you that uh, I, I've gotten to be here twice this morning. It's my second time. And if you didn't, if you didn't concentrate and really get into the words of that first song, find the words somewhere and, and read it over again. That's powerful. Hallelujah! What a what an awesome word! But uh, I want to find I want to find that and keep it with me. I've uh, it was it was inspiring. I, I recommend you look at it again. Uh, thank you for those kind words, Dr. Parrott. And uh, I'm here to, to talk to you this morning about what you've been told not to do as, as children right on up, and that is talk about yourself. But I'm going to tell you two of the most defining times of my life, and I think you'll accept it being about me. I, uh, I'm an expert on both of them. I wish I was just an expert on one of them, but uh, you'll see what I mean there also. Let me share with you, this has traveled with me. This has been to Africa. This has been around the necks of prime ministers and presidents. And as I was mentioning a while ago, little, little kids in the Congo. I'm not sure that they knew what it was, but they, they enjoyed the bling of it anyway. But this was the medal that uh, maybe more household names than Earl Young. Uh, Muhammad Ali won a medal like this. Uh, Jerry West, the great basketball player for the Lakers, won one like this. Uh, Wilma Rudolph, one of the greatest women sprinters of all time, was in my games. Rafer Johnson, we had some, some awesome athletes that was back when they used to take film and rush it back across the Atlantic so people could see it. It changed in 64 and it's so, so dramatic for you today and, and what you get to see in the Olympic Games and, and I hope you enjoy them and uh, uh, there's some great, great athletes, some great people that are gonna be out there competing to, to see who's best. I was in a little different games back in my day. There were no Nike contracts. If there had been Nike contracts, I would still be jogging. But uh, we were amateurs. We weren't allowed to have any more than $2.60, which was the value of a British pound. Whenever we traveled abroad, they'd give us room and board and two sixty, and tell us not to spend it all in one spot. If you coached, you'd lose your amateur standing. Uh, it, was, it was very rest restricted. So we ran, guys and gals ran for the, for the victory and for the sport. And I like to talk about Rome in 1960 as being one of the last games where a bunch of men and women, boys and girls, got together to see who was best. And that's, for me, that's the greatest kind of competition. I like amateur competition. Um, as Dr. Pierce said, this, this, this medal changed my life. I was no longer Earl Young. I was Earl Young, the Olympian. And let me, let me back up, and I've got a few minutes here to tell you. Let me tell you how that started. <clears throat> and that is that uh, I was born in San Fernando, California, uh, back in the day when it was the most gorgeous place in the world, there in the L.A. Basin. Uh, 
The day I was born, my dad told the doctor, there's my quarter miler. That's the same as 400 meters. And uh, that's the only prophecy that we know of dads that ever came true. But uh, uh, he said, there's my quarter miler. He had been a high school quarter miler. Could have been great if he had had the good opportunity, like I had, to go on to college and, and really uh, take his body to a higher degree of excellence. He would have been awesome. And anyway, and, and of course, during my life, like, like you all and different things that you're good at, you appreciate people complimenting you on it, and you can outrun the kid next door, and somebody applauds, and then you get into other things, and you get into high school, and they're, they're still applauding, and you're still doing pretty good. Uh, for those of you that understand the 400, uh, in high school, I ran 49.6. Not earth-shattering, especially in Southern California, where there's lots of great athletes. But one year later, as a freshman at Abilene Christian University, I ran 46.6. And that's where we had indication that, hey, maybe this kid can do something. <clears throat> when I was getting ready to graduate from high school, I was planning on going to Occidental or USC. They weren't clamoring to get me. Like I said, I 49.6, that was not a big deal. But I was sitting in class, uh, and uh, a message comes from the registrar's office to come and call my dad. So I did. And my dad says, son, he said, Oliver Jackson and Bobby Morrow are in my office and want to take us to lunch. Now, you don't know either one of those, but let me tell you, Bobby Morrow in 1956 won the 100, the 200, anchored the, the sprint relay in the games in Melbourne, Australia. He was on the cover of Life, Sports Illustrated, everything. I mean, he hit international fame. Awesome guy. And that became my hero, his running style and everything. I copied my running style after him. And there I call my dad and he says, Bobby Morrow and Oliver, Bobby Morrow. Okay, for y'all, that's like somebody calls you today and says, hey, Tiger Wood wants to take you out to lunch. That's the level we're talking on, okay? So I hop in my 55 Chevy and scoot up there to dad's office and sure enough, there he is, Bobby Morrow. I didn't know who this other guy was and that would only be funny if you knew how important this other man became to me. But that day, Oliver Jackson, the track coach, offered me a scholarship to Abilene Christian. And uh, he had only seen a picture of me finishing a 100-yard dash. And in his mind, I know he thought, you know, if this kid comes along at all, I'll at least have a good relay runner out of him. Well, we both got more than we bargained for. Uh, in 1960, when they had the games, the way they used to pick the... Uh, uh, the Olympians back in those days, the team was you would take uh, uh, six from the NC2A finals, six from the National AU finals, three from the Armed Forces. That would make up 15 that would run two heats, and then the, the winners of those, uh, eight out of those, would run the finals. The trials were at Stanford, California, gorgeous setting, awesome crowd. I was second in my semi, and the finals came around. And I came off the final curve, and I was in the lead. That was rare for me. I usually came from behind, but I was in the lead. And I knew how much energy I had left, and I knew all the guys in the race, and I knew that all I had to do was get to the tape. So coming down that straightaway, Sports Illustrated had a head-on picture that said, Grimacing Earl Young. I wasn't grimacing, I was grinning from ear to ear and had goosebumps. I knew I had made the United States Olympic team. Uh, to me, that was, and still is today, the highest that, in my sport that you can go. So I crossed the finish line in second because I got so excited. Jack Yerman, my buddy from the University of California, Berkeley, passed me. And a few years ago, we were talking about it. And he said, what happened? I said, I made the team. <laughs> you know, Go ahead with first. Right, let's get on with this, you know? No, but... Uh, uh, we traveled into to Europe, and remember, you're talking a 19-year-old kid. I've been from California to Abilene, Texas, and here we go to Europe and have a few warm-up meets before, before Rome. And, and all this team, all the, all the guys and the gals that were on this team, most of them had been abroad before running on USA teams. Many of them had been to the Olympics the previous four years. One of my idols, guy named Glenn Davis, who one time owned the world record in the 400 meter hurdles and the 400, had run in the previous Olympics. Another idol of mine. And that day in the finals of the 4x400, I handed the baton off to him. I can be a pretty emotional guy. I'm going to tell you right now, I can't tell you that story without 
without feeling emotion. This was my idol, and I'm here in the greatest race of my life, handing the baton off to him. As Dr. Parrott said, we won that race. We won the uh, New World Record in uh, 302 I think it was. And that's what I received the gold in. Now, in the Open 400, I got sixth. And I have to explain this loss. I got sixth place. I broke the world record, but there were five guys ahead of me. So the old story about picking your battles, well, that's one of those stories. But it was a new world record in 44-9. And uh, uh, again, I, don't you ever think that an old guy doesn't think back about that and get goosebumps about it and think about how you could have done better, woulda, coulda, shoulda. But it was a great thing in my life. It changed my life. Now I'm Earl Young, the Olympian. Now I go out into the world <clears throat> and this, I will tell you, I've never known a door that this wouldn't open. It didn't open for this. It opened for this. Anybody wants to see that. Now, for business purposes, I better have something to do within the next two minutes that makes sense because you're not going to have a long audience. But hey, let me see your medal. But it's, uh, it has traveled, like I said, many times to Africa and, uh, and around the world. I've had great fun with it, great joy. The reason I'm here today, that's the fun side. This is the fun side too, but it's a little different story. And that is that the most, uh, two most defining times of my life, the second time, took place on September 16th, 2011, eight years ago, uh, nine years ago, seven years ago, where are we? We're in 2020, aren't we? So in 2011, September 16th, I had a little sniffle, a little cough that I couldn't shake off. A dear friend of mine and I had just started a new company. Uh, he had invented a medical procedure that we were monetizing and uh, traveling a lot, a lot of airplanes and hotels and couldn't shake off this, this sniffle and cough. Now in Dallas, you, a lot of us get that in the summer, get an allergy and you know by September it's gone. Well, this one wasn't leaving. So I called my doc and made an appointment, went in to see him. <clears throat> Pardon me, and I'm sitting across from him. He's looking at my file. He said, uh, Earl, he said, uh, you haven't been in in four years. I said, doing well, doc, just, just sniffle and cough. He said, I know, but you know, you're, uh, uh, you need to come in and do a physical every year like everybody, like you all need to do. You need to keep up with where your body is. And uh, now he does a lot of Medicare work, so I thought, mm-hmm, that's, that's what he should be saying. That's, that's part of the business. And he said, do you have time today? Can you, can you do some tests today? I said, well, sure. So I went back and did the x-ray and uh, EKG and, and blood tests, et cetera. And I'm walking down the hall, getting ready to leave, and he's walking up the hall. And he said, oh, I'm glad you haven't left. I was just getting ready to call you. Come in my office. So I'm sitting across from him. He said, he said uh, you don't feel bad? I said, just this sniffle and cough. Now looking back, I see some things, but just this sniffle and cough. He said, well, you should feel bad. He said, your white factory, that's words he used, your white factory is shut down. He said, you're very low on whites and you're not making any. Of course, that's your immune system. I said, well, what are we going to do? Thinking he's got some shots and pills. He's got something planned here. Well, no. He said, I want you to take this file. I just called across the street to Texas Oncology. There will be a doctor meet you at the door. Wow. Kind of steps the pace up a bit. I walk over there. Sure enough, a doctor meets me at the door. I hand him the file. He opens it, looks at it says, Mr. Young, this is not good. Uh, we need to do a bone marrow biopsy. Okay, now starting right there, I might, might have known how to spell leukemia then, but I didn't, didn't know much more than that. Really didn't. So I, I didn't even know what that biopsy was going to be. But he takes me back into the procedure room. They put a needle in your hip. I know it sounds horrible, but it's not all that bad. Puts a needle in your hip, takes some fluid out. I wait in the waiting room for a while. His assistant comes and gets me. I'm sitting across from the second white coat that day. And this time he says, Mr. Young, I have some bad news. Now, I don't know how many times you've heard that in your life, but I, I can only recall that one. I don't know that I've ever had that. I have some bad news. He said, uh, you have acute myeloid leukemia. Do you know anything about that? I said, I just know that you don't want the word leukemia tied with your name. He said, well, that's, that's absolutely right. He said, let me explain to you. And there's about 70 different blood cancers. He didn't explain all those. He didn't need to because I was right up here at the top. And when he finished, he said, and you have the worst. You have acute myeloid leukemia with a mutation of FLT3, which is 
about as bad as you can get. I said, because I've seen enough television like you have, I said, how long do I have? He said, maybe three months. Wow. Cup of coffee, a little breakfast, a roll. See your doctor before noon, and by 3 o'clock, another doctor says, you're going to be dead in three months. His bedside manner was better than that, but that was the bottom line. <laughs> so he said, there's three things we can do. He said, uh, I just told you one of them. We do nothing, and uh, I don't remember how he said it, but basically, you're out of here. Number two, uh, he said, you can go on chemo and put you on chemo and medications and see how long your body, how long you're going to live. How long can I live on these meds? Number three, and hear this. This is why I'm here talking to you today. He said, we can see if they will let you have a bone marrow transplant. You know, I didn't hear all of that. I heard bone marrow transplant was a cure. That's, that's who I am. He said, that's the cure. I said, let's do that. Why would, why would I do the others? Well, I was about to learn why you do the others. The bone marrow transplant is not a skip down the street, believe me. Number one, I was 71 years old. Will they give a guy that old a bone marrow transplant because the recovery is a slice of hell? Again, I didn't know that. I was going to learn that. But he said, we'll see if we can uh, get you a bone marrow transplant. Uh, he said, meanwhile, he said, you need to check in the hospital and start on chemo. He said, uh, Baylor or Med City? I said, Med City. He said, I want you to go over there right now. We'll start in the morning. I said, wait a minute. I do need to go home and tell my wife and kids what you've just told me. So you can imagine that. Checked in that night, started chemo the next morning. I was to live on the 11th floor, a sealed off floor. You got your own air up there because that chemo destroys your immune system, as you know. You've got no defense. So if a bug gets in, gets into you, you're in big trouble. That's one reason people sometimes don't get through the recovery. They, they, their, their body can't overcome the, the bugs that come in. Anyway, I lived up there for 11 months, excuse me, for four months on the 11th floor. And what I didn't know at this time was in Offenburg, Germany, a lady named Christine Wagg had become a bone marrow donor, which means like we're going to do tomorrow going to swab your cheek, put that in an envelope along with a registration form. We send it to the lab. The lab types your DNA, goes into the National Registry. Why? Because one day you might do what she did for me. And here's what she did for me. On January 21st, 2012, four months later, in Offenburg, Germany, Christine went from Offenburg, a little village, to Dresden to a hospital. And just like a, a, a transfusion, they put a needle in here. Her blood flowed into a centrifuge that spins out, spins out the stem cells. And then back in this arm, uh, and you with healthy bodies, you got more stem cells than you know what to do with. They took those stem cells immediately to the airport at Frankfurt, flew directly to DFW, Dallas Airport, came up to my room. It was almost midnight on January 12th when two little Philippine nurses stood on chairs like these. They might have been five feet tall, but they stood on chairs like these. Put that needle in me and Christine to get that bag as high as they get it to get gravity to pull every bit of those cells that they could down into me, those life-saving cells. And Christine flowed into my body. When I tell this story, I always stop there to give praise to my Lord. And because for me, that is a metaphor. And the metaphor is it's just like our lives when we turn our lives over to Christ and he says he'll take care of our spiritual side, and he does. That's just like what Christine did for me. And guys, my blood is now O female. I'm no longer B male. So those of you that have heard the story so many times in your life how women take over your lives, let me tell you, I've got the whole kahuna here. <laughs> I got women running my life on all points. And she's doing a heck of a job. A little sidelight. Uh, she's coming over here on, uh, uh, coming to, uh, to see me on uh, March uh, 18th. And she and I are going to go out to Abilene Christian where we're having a major track meet. 
and there's some media from different areas going to be around, and we're going to jump out of an airplane, the two of us, the donor and the recipient, to try to create media attention for the need of bone marrow donors like I'm talking to you about. Guys, that is not on my bucket list. We had one of our professors at Abilene Christian who has got 6,500 jumps under his belt carry the opening game football from, uh, from 6,000 feet down uh, earlier this year, and I thought, you know, there's a way to get some attention. So I promise you. Now, Christine's the other way around. I sent her an email when I decided to do this and told her what I was going to do. And then in just in passing, I put it at the bottom of the email. I said, you want to jump with me? And the email came immediately back. Oh, yes, can I? So you know the kind of blood that I've got in here. <laughs> she, she, she is stepping, stepping up my risk taking uh, substantially. But uh, no, seriously, I'm looking forward to it. And what I'm really looking forward to is thinking that that will cause someone to say, hey, I, I'm going to be a bone marrow donor. I'm going to save a life. You know, you just, you, you're very much, uh, I'm not asking you to, uh, to jump in a foxhole. I'm not asking you to run in a burning building. But you're, you're very much uh, a first responder when you do this. There are people out there right now. Right now, there's somewhere 14, 15,000 people that need a, a bone marrow transplant now. They're laying in hospital beds wondering if they're going to find one. A young lady I met a little over a week ago named Brandy, 27 years old, has three little boys, a 10-year-old and twins at five. She's got AML, like I had. She needs a bone marrow donor. She started her chemo. They don't have the donor yet. They're looking for the donor. She may not find the donor. Hey, the donor may be sitting in this audience. Come on, this is the numbers game we're talking about. You have in your body, God created your body in such a way that science now can take your body and save another body. Another person that you may never know, someone you may get to meet like I've gotten to meet Christine. I hope that in your, in your heart that you sense that this is the right thing to do. It's what our Christ told us to do, to be very bottom line with you. This is, this is what we do. As believers, we take care of our brothers and our sisters. Well, this is one way you can do it. So many times I talk to an audience like this, and, and they say, I, I never knew. Well, I never knew either until I, until I needed. But we don't have enough donors to take care of all of the AML and all of the CLL and all of the various blood cancers that we have that this can cure sickle cell. Oh, do we need donors in the black community. This is, a, this is the only cure for sickle cell. We need donors in the Hispanic community. We need donors in all, but it's especially, especially tied in some, some groups. So I hope, you'll, I hope you'll think on this. I know you'll think on it. And I'm going to be very, very personal with you all. I hope you think on it. I hope you do it. And I hope if you don't do it, you've got a good reason. And I hope that my plea with you sticks with you all your life. Because this is what we're supposed to do, folks. When people ask for help, we're supposed to respond. That's not Earl's law. You know whose commandment that is. So please think on it. I'd like to close with a prayer and then give it back to Dr. Perrin. Father in heaven, I thank you, Father, for the opportunity to speak to my brothers and sisters this morning, to bring them this message. I pray, Father, that you'll open hearts, open minds. I hope that only good no, I don't hope. I, I pray that only good comes from this conversation we're having this morning. Bless these students and all that they do. Bless them in their lives. I thank you for their lives. I mean, they go out and do great things on this earth. In Christ's holy name, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Earl, for sharing. Thank you for your commitment to uh, 
to helping others through this uh, bone marrow transplant. If you want to see the medal, he's got it here, and welcome to. He's also having lunch with some of the track team, and others are invited in the Cooper Room at lunch. Now, tomorrow is this bone marrow transplanted, and Dr. Susan DeWitt, who leads our uh, health uh, care major, has been really the advocate for this, and it's from 10 to 2 o'clock in the student center, and all they're going to do is swab the inside of your mouth to get the DNA to put it in the bank. Then if you get called as a match eventually someday down the road, I just want to make sure everybody understands, they're not going to take your bone out. They're just going to take blood, probably just take blood. So it's like giving blood, like you would give a pint of blood, but this would probably be more than a pint, but you're like giving blood. So you're not surgically going to be impacted or whatever. I just want to make sure everybody's clear on that. Because I think people are afraid of bone marrow transplant because they don't understand what happens. Okay, that helps. I think it's, it's helpful to understand what that procedure is if you want to do this. And to do it will save a life. And talk about application of our benediction verse. It's something you can't see. Don't say it yet. You're good. Thank you. Don't say it yet. Oh, so he put it on the screen. That's why you did it. No mind is conceived that there could be somebody in Germany who could save Earl's life. Only God could conceive that. In the same way, he transforms our life with his blood. Let's pray it together. No eye has seen, no ears heard, no mind is conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Have a great day.